So, good morning from California. We'll get started now. As the 76th UN General Assembly of the United Nations virtually convenes world leaders, I'm honored to welcome each of you to this dialogue on reimagining innovation to combat climate change. On behalf of an unusual group of co-conveners from across sectors and across the world that have come together in response to this moment of code red for humanity. The co-conveners include Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs India, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs Southern California, Stanford Alumna Startups New York, Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurs Students Basis, the Rockefeller Foundation, the SDG Philanthropy Platform and Wings. I am Radhika Shah, a tech impact investor and co-president of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, a 2000 plus member community, Stanford community of alumni, students and faculty come together to advance entrepreneurship and innovation. Today, I'm also here with my hat of advisor to the Sustainable Development Goals Philanthropy Platform, a UNDP and WINGS collaboration that was launched when world leaders came together at UN headquarters in New York in 2015 to ratify a very ambitious set of goals, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, recognizing the interconnectedness of the challenges such as poverty, inequality, access to quality education, water, food, energy, conserving life on land, water, sustainable consumption and production, and more. In this moment of code red for human-driven climate change, not achieving these goals is not an option. They are essential to our very survival. According to the much anticipated recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, human-induced climate change is only affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. Scientists are also observing changes across the whole of Earth's climate system, in the atmosphere, in the oceans, ice flows, and on land. Many of these changes are unprecedented, and some of the shifts are now in motion, while some such as continued sea level rises are already irreversible for centuries to millennia ahead. But there is still time to limit climate change, according to the IPCC experts. Strong and sustained reductions in emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases could quickly make air quality better. And in 20 to 30 years, global temperatures could stabilize. One of our speakers today, Professor Pratt, will be sharing powerful modeling of anthropogenic CO2's impact. In this decade of action, if we are to combat the climate crisis, we will need each and every one of us, every organization, every nation, to come together individually and collectively to work on this challenge. Along lines of Mahatma Gandhi's thinking, it is the moment to view a relationship to nature as that of a custodian, a trustee, and not to look at nature as a resource for us to exploit. We will have to do things differently. We'll have to accelerate solutions. I believe technology innovation, including computational and data sciences, could be very powerful transformation levers to scale solutions, as could be funding business and policy innovations. We will hear shortly from inspiring speakers from industry, academia, and philanthropy on this. Also virtually joining the Stanford community today are thought leaders from around the world, including Dr. Alex Aditi, Vice Provost of the Aga Khan University, joining from Nairobi. Eminent, eminent physicist, Dr. Rajesh Gopakumar, Director of the International Center for Theoretical Sciences from Bangalore. Tony Pipa from the Brookings Institute, also formerly of USAID, where he played a key role in the SDG framework ratification. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Musa, Head of Care Asia, thought leader in alleviating poverty and combating COVID. Jennifer Henderson, who sits on the board of Ben & Jerry's, a sustainable, inclusive American ice cream company. Sustainable business leader, Dr. Ravi Mariwala, uh, MD of Smart Water. Uh, Sarah Henry, Executive Director of the Stanford Global Center for Gender Equality. And last but absolutely not the least, several amazing entrepreneurs and students are also among the participants from around the world and from the Stanford community. I will now like to invite my Stanford Days friend, Paula Mariwala, co-president and founder of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs India, a leading venture capitalist and impact investor, founder of uh, Aroles Ventures, joining from Mumbai. Over to you, Paula. Thank you so much, Radhika. 
<clears throat> and a very warm welcome to everyone on behalf of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs India, or SAE, as we like to call ourselves. SAE chapters are alumni groups of Stanford University, which bring together a unique group of um, individuals and investors with deep experience, expertise, and passion to support founders who are tackling important and challenging problems at scale. SAE groups also offer the potential to collaborate with Stanford communities and networks globally, much like this event, with a commitment to nurture innovation and create impact with the true entrepreneurial spirit that Stanford University has inculcated in us. As mentioned by Radhika, climate change is indeed upon us and is accelerating across every region of the planet resulting in widespread extreme events that are already having significant implications for economies and indeed the whole of humanity around the world. As investors, entrepreneurs, and responsible citizens, this is not a problem that we can ignore. Hence, such a dialogue with business leaders, technologists, academics, regulators, policymakers, and entrepreneurs, a diverse group of uh, individuals, is essential to search for innovative and lasting solutions for this complex issue. So without further ado, let's get directly into today's event. Uh, to start with our three stellar speakers, Mr. Nadir Godrich from Godrich Industries, Dipali Khanna of Rockefeller Foundation, and Professor Pratt from our own Stanford University. I'm gonna start by inviting Mr. Nadir Godrich, Chairman Godrich Agrovet and MD Godrich Industries, to uh, start us off by sharing his thoughts on this topic. Nadir actually needs no introduction. He's a much loved and respected member of our Stanford alumni community and is of course a well-known industry leader who has been active in developing the animal feeds, agricultural inputs and chemical businesses of Godrej Industries and associate companies. He's also deeply committed to the good and green strategies for the Godrej Group in India. Mr. Godred has the unique distinction of being an alumnus of Stanford, MIT, and HPS. An exceptionally talented and multifaceted person, Nadir will share his thoughts in his unique, inimitable style of rhyming poetry, which is bound to create a poetic and thought-provoking start to the session. Before we start, just a couple of housekeeping rules. This is a Zoom webinar where audience will not be visible uh, and will be muted, but we welcome the audience to please post questions in the Q&A box, uh, which you will see at the bottom of the screen. And time permitting, we will try to get the speakers to respond to most of the questions. And we will try to keep the format as engaging and interactive as possible throughout the session. Uh, over to you, Nadir, for now. Uh, let's, let's hear you take it. Thank you very much, Paula. The world's becoming a better place, though, at a slow but steady pace. But problems are still there for sure. And climate change is at the fore. Inequality is also dire and steadily getting higher. If progress on all these is slow, the consequences are grave, we know. Their skills and their constraints are such that governments can't do that much. NGOs have few means but skill and business has means but no will. These issues aren't part of their core. For profits is how they would score. But businesses now realize that profits are a short-term prize. For after all, what do they gain if they die out and don't sustain? How much can they afford to spend to ensure their existence doesn't end? If the efforts of all are combined, the synergies that we can find reduces cost and raises gain and obviates inevitable pain. There is a capitalistic strain that enthrones shareholder gain. And Milton Friedman could well see that this simplistic philosophy could lead to great efficiency. But wherever there's externality, this capitalism, red in tooth and claw, can prove to be a dismal flaw. Correction can come from regulation or even from self-remediation. And Adam Smith himself foresaw that business could address this flaw. It should be clearly understood. One can do well 
by doing good. Doing it smartly, we do better. So why not be the trendsetter? In capitalism's early days, we see some social responsibility to dissipate the urban gloom, both Cadbury, Lord Leverhulme, then pioneered the company town. There are observers who would frown at this paternal attitude, but some view it with gratitude. We should remember that in that age, it compensated their lowly wage. And doing good is very sound. What goes around does come around. My grandfather probably saw these examples and found no flaw. He bought far away marshy land. His critics just couldn't understand. They concluded he had gone quite mad. But today we are glad, not sad. A township then slowly arose, and this is where our business grows. We provided every needed tool, housing, hospital, and school. My uncle, known as SPG, way back could very clearly see the environment was under stress. Neglect, he knew, would be a mess. Our creekside land was reserved. The mangroves there were well preserved. And from my office, I gaze out there, a Mumbai view that's very rare, with greenery all the way until you sight New Bombay. And now and then with friends I float on a gently moving boat with pink flamingos in full flight, to my mind, a splendid sight. In saving tigers, he played a role. The environment was a major goal. A foundation has a role to play, but CSR is another way. And here I think we all ought to pay careful heed to Michael Porter. With shared values, there's no cost for doing good as nothing's lost. All it takes is a thinking brain to remove a societal pain and combine it with a business gain to create a sustainable chain of endless mutual benefit. This concept is a tremendous hit. We thought that we should also try and see if we could apply this philosophy to our group. Our employees also joined the loop. In the year 2010, studies were commissioned and then with the help of DASRA and FSG, our new program, one could see. We aptly named it Good and Green and what a journey it has been. And how do we define our role? What could be a proper goal? The environment we clearly see, then health and employability. It is no longer climate change within a tolerable range. A crisis is what it's about with fires, floods, as well as drought. Every week, a constant blast, far worse than seen in the past. If we must, we will adapt. Prevention, though, would be more apt. There is a cost to adaptation. It's rising fast in every nation. In fact, we should by now conclude prevention would be really shrewd. It actually would cost much less. Indeed, avoid a lot of stress. A uniform carbon tax would protect all our backs, collected by each nation state, but universal in its rate. All GHGs would be fair game. Every country should charge the same. The benefit that this would yield would be a level playing field. Competitors just wouldn't care because the system's very fair. Just how high should this tax be? A range of numbers we can see, but $60 per metric ton would surely get reduction done. For carbon, this could be the rate. For others, we would calibrate the appropriate rate we would select based on the greenhouse gas effect. Based on today's emissions rate, quite candidly, I should state, it wouldn't be a trivial sum, but there's no reason to be glum. In dollars, it would be two trillion. It is a lot, but not a zillion. Compared to global GDP, the percentage is less than three. Compared to taxes, then again, the percentage is, is less than 10. Of course, some would then take a call to reduce emissions, not pay at all. But bear in mind, it's not a cost for the economy. Nothing's lost. A UBI could be instated. Some other tax could be abated. And if this is indeed just so, the economy would still grow. Don't you think it's very nice that there is hardly any price and nothing really would be lost as adaptation has a higher cost. 
in the Godrich group, it is seen that our goals of good and green, though ambitious, will be done. Sustainability can be won. With the pandemic still in play, there would, of course, be some delay. And so without partiality, our goal for all was neutrality, whether water, carbon, or solid waste. By 2020, we would make haste to make our net emissions zero. Would that make the group a hero? In 2010, the goal looked tall, but we took a reasoned call. Technology would save the day. So far, it has turned out that way. As technology takes a leap, green energy gets very cheap. Technology can lead the way. Technology can save the day. New technologies can be great. We always love to investigate. Once they are tried and pass the test, we sometimes choose to invest. Keen observers quickly saw that solar also tracks Moore's law. But the groundnut shell or the gas are India's full of biomass. At first, we thought we'd have to spend, but that's not true. For in the end, the more we thought, the more we slaved. We did invest, but we also saved. And solar will hit the goal of being cheaper than even coal in just a handful of years. Already, we and our peers are sourcing solar electricity at lower rates than from the utility. For quite some time, we've been extorted as their finances aren't still sorted. A silver lining can be seen since it incentivizes green. There are many paths that we can see for achieving carbon neutrality, but the cheapest way is certainly through energy efficiency. In times of plenty, it was fine to overuse and overdesign, but now we find we always gain if we only use our brain. Real interest rates are very low and high returns quickly flow from any energy saving device. For business, this is very nice. Not only are returns quite brisk, there's also very little risk. In India, mandated CSR can help us go very far. Multiple benefits is what one sees with water projects or growing trees. Good livelihoods are created. Our carbon emissions are abated. Trees planted at a river source maintain the flow throughout its course. So many benefits we can see. The preservation of biodiversity. Now different species can be tried. Useful products can be supplied like biomass or edible fruits, and yet the trunk and the roots can sequester carbon, clean the air, a win-win that is very fair. So while we decarbonize, why not also monetize? So never fall for either or. Our hearts and minds demand much more. Through action and advocacy, we can help all humanity to create a world that's just and fair and everyone is free to share nature's bounty and be fulfilled. And then I'm sure we'd all be thrilled. The question now is really whether all of us can pull together. We will get collective traction only with committed action. The only way we can gain is to unitedly sustain. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Nadir, for those inspiring uh powerful verses, uh, I kind of lost track of, uh, um, of what I'm supposed to do next. <laughs> really, really powerful. Thank you, Nadir. And I just love the optimism and energy we brought into this moment of darkness and hopelessness that all of us feel. Um, thank you again. Um, uh, getting the Pali? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I'm uh, translating that. Well, I just wanted to also so touch by Nadir's uh, um uh, talk that i wanted to take a second to acknowledge yes. the power of it yeah uh, so uh, now we will uh, go to Deepali. um Deepali khanna um is joining us today um and it is an honor to introduce Deepali khanna who is the md of the asia office of the rockefeller foundation where she oversees the foundation's policy advocacy grant making and strategic partnerships in asia Deepali leads the foundation's initiatives to convene and catalyze strategic collaborations that advance development in Asia, as well as harness Asia's role in enhancing the well-being of humanity in the region and around the world. Tipali comes with more than three decades experience in the development sector, including senior leadership roles at MasterCard Foundation, Plan International and UNICEF. 
across Asia and Africa. When I first met Deepali at the launch of the Kenya SDG Accelerator Lab in their beautiful New York offices um, at the Rockefeller Foundation, I was so touched by the inclusive and gender lens and warm spirit that she brought to development and her humility, which is not common uh, among those from the top foundations in the world. Um, we have another amazing speaker now lined up. Um, welcome Deepali. Thank you so much. Um, and good morning and good evening to all who've joined us virtually today. Thank you so much, Mr. Godrich, for an amazing poetic speech, which is really spectacular. And I find it very difficult to follow you, but I'll try. Uh, foremost, I wish, want to thank Stanford Age, Angels and Entrepreneurs for hosting this important dialogue and for bringing such a diverse group of actors together to discuss a critical issue. Thank you, Radhika and Paula, for inviting me to speak alongside Professor Pratt and Mr. Godridge. It is truly an honor. Our convening here in the backdrop of the UN General Assembly couldn't be more aptly timed. We need to marshal important voices in this movement to call for decisive action to meet the rapidly approaching deadline to achieve the SDGs while prioritizing the climate crisis and pandemic recovery. I hope it builds further momentum ahead of the upcoming UNGA convenings on energy and food systems and ultimately COP26. Since COVID-19 has derailed progress on many fronts to achieve the SDGs, specifically SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, and SDG 13, which is climate action, we need to massively increase investments that simultaneously help us secure a low carbon future, particularly in energy. The urgency of transitioning to clean energy is especially evident in our current context, more relevant than ever in light of the alarming findings of the latest IPCC report. Despite the pandemic and reduced mobility, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has hit a historic high. Even though economies worldwide were nearly ground to a halt for over 15 months, leading to a startling drop in global greenhouse gas emissions, it li did little to show the steady accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Creating access to clean and reliable energy for billions of under-electrified people across the world without massively tipping the emission scales will require us to achieve two key outcomes. First, unlock innovative financing, and second, advance new technologies. Building the past systems of the future requires mobilization of capital on a previously unimagined scale and the whole scale reallocation of capital away from legacy fuel technologies. This is really an opportunity worth more than $1 trillion per year, encompassing grid scale renewables, clean distributed generation, and enabling grid investments. Renewable generation te technologies alone need to attract more than $630 billion of investment every year between now and 2040. To reach global climate and development goals, which is roughly twice the current level of investment. But neither the government nor the private sector can do this alone. As Mr. Godrit said, we need to be collaborating. At the global level, we've seen an uptick in funding to support energy transition, yet many struggle to identify viable investable ready projects. Without a platform for capital to be deployed more efficiently at scale to support this expansion of local renewable energy product projects, governments are unable to achieve renewable electrification and development targets. The growing interest and investment in India's clean tech startup ecosystem, for instance, while it is still in its nascent stages, is not only positive for the country's own energy transition, but also offers the potential for global impact. Communities in India share characteristics with communities across Southeast Asia and Africa, which means that if impact investors or venture capitalists back new technologies developed in India, they could be scaled to benefit the global south. That is why we at the Rockefeller Foundation, along with the IKEA Foundation, joined forces to create a coalition along with other leaders with a billion dollar investment that will catalyze $20 billion in funding by 2030. 
In June 2021, we also partnered with the International Finance Corporation to deploy $150 million of our Rockefeller Foundation's catalytic capital in blended finance to further mobilize up to $2 billion of private sector investment. This coalition with the IKEA Foundation will do three things. First, mobilize and coordinate concrete energy transition roadmaps to unlock public and private capital flows into DRE technologies to help create local jobs, promote sustainable livelihoods, and build an environmentally smart resilient electricity grid of the future. Second, identify and support regulatory policy and financial regimes in partnership with national leadership that will build capacity and create an environment to increase renewable energy technology investments. Third, promote collaborations to enhance project development and new financing instruments to catalyze billions of dollars of additional annual investment in underserved markets, including Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Asia. In terms of financing new technologies, the coalition will expand its demand aggregation of renewable technology facility to reduce technology capex costs through standardization, procurement aggregation, and financing for storage and solar technologies. As part of its grid-based energy transition efforts, mechanisms to incentivize utilities will be implemented to decommission large aging coal plants before the end of the economic lives and where viable, repurpose them for various productive end uses, including solar and wind plants and energy storage. Reducing the cost of decentralized energy solutions is fundamental to ending energy poverty in a low carbon manner. The International Energy Agency's World Energy Outlook in October of last year heralded polar, a solar PV's potential, declaring it the cheapest source of electricity in history. And yet, for instance, mini grid developers in Sub-Saharan Africa pay, pay somewhere between 2.5 and 3.8 times as much as the global average for lithium ion batteries and more than 20% above average for PV. Financing new technologies that enable reduction in the cost of energy storage, solar PV panels in Sub-Saharan Africa to global averages would by itself decrease energy storage prices by 70% and those of distributed renewable energy by 30%. Such reductions would decrease the cost of providing electricity access for 200 million people by $7 billion. Lifting billions out of energy poverty will not be easy, but it is not impossible. Nations across the globe are focused on recovering from the pandemic, but in doing so, combating climate change, creating equitable access to energy and economic opportunities cannot be left behind. In fact, they're interlinked. If we want to be successful in mobilizing large-scale capital that benefits poor and vulnerable people and addresses the world's most pressing challenges, we need to meet the risk-return requirements of mainstream investors while ensuring the robustness of the impact, regardless of whether impact is part of the investment strategy of these investors. So as the IPCC report indicates, we are not on track to achieve our climate goals. To reach our SDGs by 2030, this must be the decade of action. The urgency has never been more. It is now or never. Thank you. Thank you again, Deepali, for such a powerful, insightful presentation. And uh, especially loved your linking of innovation and in technology, financing, and policy. And, and kind of the deep focus on a just transition that leaves no one behind in the two spirit of the SDGs. Thank you again. Thank you for joining. Um, and now, last but absolutely not the least, I am delighted to introduce Stanford Professor Emeritus Juan Pratt, an early pioneer in the field of computer science. Um, I would have said we have left the, the best for last, but I can't say that with such powerful speakers. I think all three are so amazing. Um, um, Professor Pratt has made several contributions to foundational areas, such as search algorithms, sorting algorithms, and primality testing. There are two sides to the work of this visionary professor, the pioneering mathematical theorist and thought leader, and the problem solver entrepreneur. Professor Pratt is a recipient of the University of Sydney Alumna Award for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. 
He contributed in various ways to the early operations and founding of Sun Microsystems, a company that transformed technology and computing. He was a member of the Stanford team that created Stanley, a self-driving uh, car uh, vehicle um, that won the DARPA high-speed desert driving competition. Professor Pratt traces his current work on climate change and debunking fallacies of climate change denialism back to his university days when he was taught about the greenhouse effect. He was unhappy to see much of that information later ignored or misrepresented in the media. Many moons ago, I myself was a student in Professor Pratt's computer science class at Stanford, and I'm absolutely thrilled to invite him to share perspectives on climate change and, and how we can understand it better. Welcome, Professor Pratt. Well, thank you, uh, Radhika, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to speak here. I'm honored. Um, I think I will just uh, launch right into my talk here since it's already 9.31 p.m. according to my uh, yeah. Um, so I will, uh, let me know, am I sharing the screen? Yes, it's, uh, we can see the screen, Professor Pratt. Very good. Okay. So um, what I'm uh, doing in this talk is trying to make uh, the reasoning behind the physical basis for climate change more accessible to the technically inclined public. So I realize not all of you are necessarily very technically inclined. Uh, so I'm trying to simplify what's going on, uh, in particular making it simpler than what you can find in the assessment reports, the periodic assessment reports from the IPCC. So uh, uh, let me begin uh, with uh, a brief run through to, through the basics. So all of our uh, warmth comes from the sun um, and it uh, um, reaches the Earth, on, at least on the daylight side, um, and uh, that heat then has to be radiated back to space. And it's the control of that radiation that is governing our climate. Uh, the greenhouse effect is the effect whereby CO2 and other greenhouse gases, including water vapor, uh, accumulate in the atmosphere to limit uh, how much radiation goes out. And so in that way, it keeps the planet warmer. If it wasn't for greenhouse gases, the oceans would be frozen solid because we are not that close to the sun that we have enough warmth to do it without greenhouse gases. I'd like to say a word or two about the greenhouse effect. Um, this is a picture of the effect. Uh, what happens is uh, it's not just the surface of the earth that is radiating uh, the heat away to space to keep us cool, but the whole atmosphere has to do it. So some of the radiation that reaches space uh, comes from surface down here, uh, but some of it comes from higher up in the atmosphere, all the way up to the stratosphere, which is at about 35,000 feet. Um, so what happens is that the bottom is cold, that is at uh, sea level, and at, uh, the stratosphere is quite, sorry, it's warm, I mean, uh, at the bottom. And up here at the top, it's uh, very cold. So the radiation that comes from low down uh, is very strong. Um, and the radiation that comes from high up is much weaker because cold does not radiate, radiate as effectively as, um, as heat, as, as warmth. So um, on the other hand, uh, the radiation from down below has to fight its way through a lot more atmosphere than the radiation from on high. So these two effects kind of cancel out and you end up with the amount of radiation uh, reaching space being equivalent to roughly from halfway up. So even though it's coming from all parts of the atmosphere, you can mentally think of it as coming from the middle and the middle is at about zero degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly where your uh, freezer uh, ought to be, your fridge freezer. Um, so that's the greenhouse effect. Um, so I want now to look at uh, CO2 for starters, just to give you some idea of what CO2 has been doing uh, for the last uh, about 2000 years. Uh, in fact, I'll look not at just 20 centuries, but in fact, 21 centuries, because we're interested in looking forward to the future as well. So I'm going to divide this into the pre-industrial era, which is uh, up to what I'll take to be 1776, which is not because it's the American Revolution, but because it's the year that Scottish engineer James Watt 
sold his first practical steam engine. And so the industrial era of time from then onwards. And so I'm gonna show you uh, graphs of CO2, which have got thin dark lines, which is what we actually know about CO2. And then a, I'll give you a model of CO2 due to somebody called David Hoffman, uh, late of uh, uh, Boulder NOAA. And Hoffman's law models uh, CO2 as an, or at least that's anthropogenic CO2, as an exponentially growing function of time. Another like Moore's law, which is also exponentially growing, but about 20 times slower. So whereas Moore's law says uh, doubling of various things is every year and a half or so, uh, anthropogenic CO2 doubles every 34.5 years. In fact, we can give it very precisely. Here's a picture of the pre-industrial era showing, showing non-anthropogenic CO2. This is CO2 is 280 plus or minus five parts per million. So here's the sort of middle uh, starting in the year dot, uh, starting in uh, 1 CE, uh, and going all the way up to 1776. And the observed CO2, which we find in the Antarctic, where we dig up ice cores and measure the, uh, uh, the amount of CO2 in them, uh, stays in that range. And now I'm going to advance this, uh, starting in, we're going to enter the industrial era, and we'll see CO2 rising. So the red curve, uh, is the part that's in the industrial uh, era. And by now we've reached 420 parts per million. Um, and so let's look again at Hoffman's law, 280 plus or minus five, add the anthropogenic component. Uh, that's what we've been adding, uh, or at least that's what remains in the atmosphere after we've added it. And it can be modeled as either R to the W, where R is 1.0203 and W is the number of years since what invented or sold his uh, first practical steam engine. Now you can also think of it as two to the W divided by 34.5, which is to say 34.5 years is the doubling period for anthropogenic CO2. Okay, now um, let's move along a little bit. I'd like to zoom in on this section here to give you a better idea. This portion here where it gets thicker is not ice cores anymore, but the CO2 measured at Mauna Loa. So let's zoom into that. Um, we're uh, uh, stretching it out a bit. Uh, we want to focus on this century. So starting in the year 2000 up to today, uh, 2021. And you'll see this is what we measure at uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory. It oscillates because um, during the winter, uh, CO2 rises, and then in the spring, when the um, foliage, this is in the northern hemisphere, by the way, the foliage starts drawing down CO2 because it has a use for it, obviously, to convert it to carbohydrates. And when that's finished, it'll go back to uh, this level here. And so every year, so we've got here 20 cycles of this oscillation. Okay, so uh, I now want to uh, zoom out to 2100. So we're going to have this stay fixed at that end, 2000. But instead of going just to 2021, we're going to look at the mo what model predicts would happen if the red curve stayed inside uh, Hoffman's law. So here we go. And uh, right uh, down here, we still got. Ah, so by the way, uh, what I have noted here is. I claim that uh, this is, uh, in 2021, the climate is 1.1 degrees centigrade Celsius above pre-industrial. Um, I further claim, this is a little less plausible because down here we can actually look at what happened and say, oh yeah, that's what happened. Uh, here, uh, we don't know what's going to happen because we don't know what's going to happen to CO2, but I'm going to argue that if CO2 uh, stays inside here, then it will hit 3.4 degrees C above pre-industrial when we get to 2100. So let's go for that. Um, and I'm gonna do this by pointing out, first of all, that climate is always changing. So we can't just look at climate and right away infer from past behavior. Um, I'm claiming that almost all the changes are sub-centennial, meaning that they're faster than uh, like decadal and annual and uh, multi-decadal and so on. Centennial climate will be climate that 
uh, is measured in uh, averaged over longer periods, uh, over averaged over 65 years or more. And I'm going to show you that climate is in, centennial climate is influenced only by CO2 and the sun. Uh, so let's do that. Oh, and uh, then uh, if that were true, uh, and if uh, in part three, the claim is 1.85 degrees C per doubling of CO2, we can then actually calculate what these uh, values would be. So here's uh, climate always changing. Looks uh, pretty uh, random, in fact. And the red thing is uh, what we would expect CO2 to do if the 1.85 number were actually true. So I'm going to increase my moving average window from one to something wider. Uh, it's going up to 2030 and more. We're removing the fast changes until bingo, we've got to centennial climate. Okay, so let's narrow the field a bit. Um, so um, centennial climate, um, uh, Looks actually that this model looks pretty good uh, starting at about 1950 or so, uh, but it's not such a great model in the first part of the century. And so, if we look at the difference, we have this green curve here for the residual. And uh, wondering, you know, what, okay, can we explain this? Well, let's look at the sun. Uh, the sun, I'll take TSI, uh, that's total solar irradiance from the sun. And we'll divide that by three. This is all centennial, mind you. Um, it's a perf It's a very good match to that residual, which suggests that maybe we should incorporate the sun into our model. So instead of just set settling for 1.85 times log two, let's add uh, the total solar irradiance divided by three to that. And now we get a wonderful match. So. Um, we can infer from this that at least over this period, centennial climate is well modeled by just looking at CO2 and the sun. Now, the sun is sort of sitting there with this lazy oscillation. So basically we shouldn't be afraid of the sun. It's been that way for millions of years. The CO2, however, is climbing dramatically. And so this is where we do our calculation. Uh, we say, okay, uh, today it's 420, uh, divide that by 280, that's the amount by which it's increased, take log two to count the doublings, multiply by 1.85 degrees per doubling. So that tells us, uh, confirms that uh, what we know already that we've risen 1.1 degrees. That's centennial climate, mind you. And now for the uh, end of, uh, for the end of the century, uh, centennial climate should be 3.4 degrees C above, uh, above um, pre-industrial. So I'm sorry I went over time there, but uh, that is uh, what I have to say. Ready to go? Yeah, thank you, Professor Pratt. I think uh, I was, Paula was going to thank you, hence my silence. It was a very powerful presentation. Um, and really, thank you, really thank you, Professor Pratt. Uh, I mean, we loved the figures because it really quantifies, uh, you know, what we talk about and puts a whole different uh, different aspect um, of seeing climate change, that is how real it is. Um, on that note, uh, uh, you know, there have been several questions around this. Um, and I think if I, if I combine a few of those questions, um, we are wondering really, Professor Pratt, I think it's, it's very clear that, uh, you know, uh, anthropogenic carbon is, is a real issue, uh, but how does one really mitigate, uh, you know, this whole global warming caused by uh, anthropogenic carbon, are there, what are the real challenges and what do we as, uh, you know, uh, business people, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, how do we work with maybe other stakeholders like governments, uh, philanthropists, uh, policymakers to really mitigate this very real phenomena? Is there, uh, and what are the real uh, barriers to, to moving forward on some of these issues? Well, actually? Right. Well, uh, so the biggest barrier I see is preventing uh, CO2 from accumulating in the atmosphere. And the problem is that the moment it leaves the ground, uh, it enters a supply chain, uh, which has a huge amount of inertia and which eventually finds its way to some consumer or other who then uses it for energy. Uh, if you don't use it, it'll just pile up somewhere. But we have no way of storing these staggering quantities of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, that we've been digging out of uh, out of the ground. So, as I see it, the only way to stop this is to stop it right at the source and to gradually reduce the amount that we remove from the ground, uh, in keeping with 
uh, what we can replace it with. So at the moment, we're not really well set up to uh, replace fossil fuels, um, uh, but uh, what we need to do is accelerate uh, all of the renewable energy sources to the point where we can start reducing what we dig out of the ground. And I think that's the only solution. All these geoengineering solutions uh, don't impress me very much uh, because uh, they still leave the CO2 in the atmosphere and CO2 does more than just heat the planet. It also lowers the pH of the ocean. Uh, and so we really need to stop putting the, the CO2 into the, into the atmosphere. Thank, thank you, Professor Pratt, and thank you again for a very, very inspiring presentation and bringing the power of science and data, and that modeling is just so groundbreaking um, to see how, how closely it models reality. Uh, I have a question now for Nadir uh, and others if you have any thoughts. Uh, Nadir, I have two questions, if I may be, we are a bit tight on time, so whichever and whatever, however you want to answer them. Sure. Uh, one is... Uh, what are learnings for the developing countries to not repeat some of the mistakes of the developed world that impact the current global warming crisis, especially given the urgent need for economic growth, job creation in a post-pandemic world? What is the growth path forward that minimizes and mitigates the global warming crisis? And the second question is from, we're also going to weave in audience questions. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Gopakumar, um, the director of ICTS, uh, one of the leading physicists in the world. Um, is, a, is a scientist, so it's a long, complex question, but I love it. I'm going to read it. The multifaceted nature of the challenge that climate change poses compels us to also think of innovative knowledge structures arcing across industry, academia, and the social sector. I feel our existing structures are geared towards solving problems by breaking it into small subparts using specialized domain knowledge, but this approach is perhaps inadequate here how can we foster a more synthesis-oriented approach given the innumerable linkages involved? Can industry take the lead in supporting new initiatives in partnership with academia and the social sector in meaningfully connecting these three different sectors while bringing in a new thinking all around? And he's particularly interested in your response, Nadir, but also if the other panelists want to react to the question. Okay. As regards the first question, since uh, we still have a lot of development to do in developing countries, it's both a challenge because we need carbon space to do that development, but because we are coming late to the game, we can deploy the latest technologies. So it's both a challenge and an opportunity. And uh, already in India, there's a big project for green energy. And I think that uh, energy efficiency has to be given much more importance. It is being given importance, but it's a low hanging fruit and we could easily do it. And ultimately we will need uh, good sequestration technologies. The best sequestration technology we have today is uh, trees, but uh, uh, potentially even in fossil fuel plants where the carbon dioxide leaves the plant in a concentrated state, it may be possible to collect the carbon dioxide. Also green energy that is stranded could be used to convert carbon dioxide into fuels, uh, say green energy in the Sahara Desert or green energy in Iceland where you can't move it out usefully could be used to capture carbon dioxide. So there are lots of technical solutions and the ultimate solution is of course fusion energy. And we seem to be getting closer. There's been magnetic progress recently at MIT, which might uh, bring fusion energy closer to us. If we have fusion energy, we can easily solve the problem. It is true that a systems approach would help to solve a lot of these problems, but a systems approach is, I agree, difficult to implement in the world we are living in but any ideas to have more of a systems approach should be pursued. May, may I also, um, Paula, change the schedule a bit and I'd love to get Deepali's reaction to the systems yes, approach question yes. because uh, in the world of New York, I think there's a lot of uh, dialogue and you guys are taking that. So is that okay, Deepali too? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, Mr. Godrej said that so well, like we really need a systems level approach. And also, the, you know, the question that was raised uh, around how do we get the 
ecosystem actors together. And I think, you know, we spend a lot of time at the foundation to really see how we can actually break the silos where, you know, work is happening, but, you know, that intersectionality and that collaboration across sectors is really going to be important. So the Global Energy Alliance platform that we are creating, that's one where we want to get all the philanthropic capital to be able to come together. We want to be getting the countries across if Asia, Africa, and Latin America. In fact, just this morning, we had a high level dialogue because, you know, as we have launching this platform, which is going to be officially done at COP26, we want to be responsive to the needs of the countries. You know, you can't be sitting in New York or um, in Stanford to be determining what is really the need. So, you know, how do you kind of really have the bottom up planning where you really understand what the countries commitments are where they want to be and what the, where the bottlenecks are and how can you also then be promoting best practices and sharing you know where the policy environment has been tackled more effectively in a few geographies what really worked what didn't work also on the technology piece how can we really be collaborating i mean the, the storage piece for solar is an important one you know and how can we come together and not be each one of us doesn't need to be investing on you know, similar technologies, how can we really look at advancing and not duplicating efforts? So, you know, through our platform, we're really hoping that, you know, that becomes an aggregator, you know, where you have the International Solar Alliance, you have the arenas of the world, you have the Sustainable Energy Alliance, you know, there's space for everybody to be part of that platform and be able to see how at the end of the day, we can really move the needle for the billions of populations that we really want to be pulling out of poverty, as well as be reducing the carbon emissions. So I think, you know, how do we make all this happen? I think another example that I just want to share is that I've seen in India, which has been really, really something which is kind of important for us to kind of think through. You know, we've been talking about health, energy as different SDGs, but you know, if you really want to be looking at what has the pandemic taught us, you know, we need to be better prepared. Our public health infrastructure should be well prepared. Now, if that's the case, we've also seen how renewable energy became an essential service during the pandemic, you know, so renewable energy was able to really solarize these health centers. So why are we not kind of really looking at what your public health institutions of the future should be? How can we be looking at it from a climate perspective? How can we be looking at it from a renewable energy perspective? And similarly, when you're looking at the agriculture and energy nexus, there's just so much of potential where you kind of multiple, you, you kind of having the kind of impact on multiple fronts, which at the end of the day, I think we all care about climate issues, we all care about really helping people pull out of poverty. So I think, you know, this is really our attempt and would really want to see many more people becoming part of this alliance because there's so much that we need to learn and understand and really get better. So we also want to be more agile and be able to really fail fast if that's needed because the clock is really clicking or ticking for all of us. So let me stop at that. Thank you, Deepali. Professor Pratt, any reactions to uh, Rajesh's question before I hand back to Paula? Oh, sorry, I was just typing an answer to somebody else's question. I wasn't paying attention. Uh, uh, remind me. Uh, uh, the question is about the multifaceted nature of the challenges. And uh, is there a role for uh, more linkages between academia, industry, um, uh, the NGO sector? Well, the problem is that, uh, well, not the problem, but, uh, that the challenge here is identifying which area you have in mind for academia. Since academia has a standard, uh, we have 10 schools, uh, and so uh, one could uh, pick any school and find uh, uh, roles that they could play. Uh, so I don't think there's a, a simple answer to that. Um, if you, okay, what can the, um, what can the uh, medical people do? Well, they can have help with... Uh, Health, uh, health challenges, uh, what can uh, the um, uh, physicists do? So they can understand the climate better, what can uh, the um, first and, and uh, there's, there's a whole school of earth sciences, what can they do? Well, they can basically uh, attack the root problem. Uh, there's the um, uh, arts and humanities, um, uh, so they can, uh, besides writing poetry, uh, they can uh, uh, they can provide uh, uh, communication, uh, insight to uh, uh, social problems, uh, and so on. So I don't think there's a simple answer to this. In, in fact, it almost feels like there's room for it's a tough one, as all three of you say, and yet much needed. 
my opinion, perhaps we could plan a round table with uh, some of you on brainstorming on this specific question. Um, back to you, Paula. No, definitely, um, uh, you know, thank you all the three panelists. I think there's such an important human element as well that ties in all these topics together. Um, and I just want to shift gears and bring in uh, uh, two entrepreneurs from our Stanford community uh, who are actually implementing some of the things that we've talked about on the ground. So I would love to get their perspective uh, uh, from ground zero, so to say. Uh, so I just quickly introduce uh, Himanshu uh, Gupta and Anshuman Bapna, both uh, Stanford alums. Himanshu, a Stanford GSP alum who has a 10 years, more than 10 years of experience in climate change and who's the founder of Climate.ai, a company focused on accelerating climate resilience in mission critical supply chains like agriculture. And Anshuman Bapna, also a Stanford alum and a serial entrepreneur, is building Terra.do, a Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs portfolio company, uh, through which he's shaping a community of change makers to work towards the climate resilience by creating a fantastic um, a cohort of uh, students who, who are really learning a lot about uh, uh, climate change, uh, you know, and uh, I mean, Professor Pratt's presentation really uh, made me realize how important it is for us to be properly educated about all the, all the challenges. Um, um, I just also want to say there are many questions in the, in the Q&A box, and if any of the speakers can answer some of those questions, please go ahead. Uh, I think the audience would really love to get your your responses. Uh, we're running a bit short on time, but we will try to come back to some of the questions for the speakers. But I'm going to right now uh, do some rapid fire rounds with uh, with uh, with the entrepreneurs, and uh, I'm going to start with Himanshu. Himanshu, your company is of course called Climate.ai. So I want a, a really quick answer from you on how um, climate and um, AI intersect. Um, you know, how does it work, you know, when there's such a strong human side to this? Um, and, you know, how does that help with adoption? And since Climate AI is, is quite focused on, um, on agriculture, uh, particularly in, in the current times of post-pandemic, where more countries are turning towards local supply chains, in your opinion, what are the innovations that will enable uh, agriculture productivity in the coming years, which is really going to be so crucial, um, you know, for humanities, particularly for the developing countries. So over to Himachu. Thanks, Paula. And thanks, uh, Paula and Radhika, for inviting me in. Um, it's great to be you know, in the same panel as, as Nadir, uh, Radhika, and, and Professor Pratt. Um, how much time do I have? I want to be respectful of the time. Uh, we want you to really answer quickly, but because we have a couple of more sure. questions. So just uh, get a flavor of it and maybe you can refer to some of the examples uh, and we can uh, you know give give them links to, to go more deeper into perhaps three -ish, three -ish minutes per since yes. we can be thinking getting into lots of questions and then again sounds in the next yes sounds good so uh, i'll i'll just give a brief introduction of what climate ai does um, so we are a climate resilience platform we help um, companies and supply chains uh, adapt to climate change and the process work with their suppliers as well. So it becomes a win-win process. And the reason we started in food and agriculture and going back to your point, Radhika, uh, while it's a code red, what IPCC mentioned, it's code blue in agriculture. Now, what that means is in, in medical terms, code red is when a hospital is under fire, right? And you have to sound that alarm. Code blue is when a patient is under cardiac arrest. And, and that's what I'm seeing uh, and we are seeing in agriculture globally across the world. Uh, Madagascar's story is a prime story. We all you know, eat uh, vanilla flavored ice creams and cakes every day. And it's the most, one of the most premium crops in the world uh, is vanilla, grown mostly in Madagascar. Now Madagascar is, is going through uh, extended period of droughts. It's been one and a half years. And then compounded by COVID, the situation is, uh, has reached such dire levels there that most of the farmers community in the south of Madagascar are having to sell their daughters to meet their ants meat, right? And that's why it's, 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 it's code blue when it comes to climate and agriculture. We, we just can't wait for any scenarios to play out in you know, two degrees, four degrees and six degrees. We need to act now. And I think Deepali also mentioned that 
uh, uh, you know, the urgency is, is, is underestimated, the urgency which we are dealing with. Uh, so going back to your point, uh, Paula, as far as climate and AI is concerned, uh, now climate is both a big data problem uh, and a lack of data problem. And I'll explain how. And that's where AI becomes very helpful. So it, when it comes to climate change and, and Professor Pratt showed that graph, past is not the predictor of the future. So that's what we are seeing. We are seeing like unprecedented heat wave in the Pacific Northwest in the US, temperatures crossed uh, 48 degrees. Like if you were living in Seattle and if you were to ask someone, you know, 48 degrees temperature, uh, you know, in the middle of sep September, they would freak out. And that happened. Um, um, so similarly, we saw floods in Germany. Um, and of course, these events are being seen every, every almost every month in the developing economies. So it's a big data problem. Um, where you know you <clears throat> the, the historical data is not enough to predict. So it's it's the there's a terabytes of data coming from weather stations, satellite imagery, soil sensors, and whatnot. And you have to make sense of like, can we really rely on historical data uh, to arrive at future predictions? So that's one, and that's where AI actually helps up, helps a lot in matching patterns um, and <clears throat> and and in fact creating patterns the in a way that the, the world has not seen in terms of climate, uh, climate change. Next one. Second is, is the lack of data. And as we are seeing in agriculture, uh, there's even in developed economies, uh, we, we don't have enough uh, data on historical yields, quality, nutrition, and so on and so forth uh, in the farms to be able to make a sense of how climate is going to impact a particular supply chain. In, in, in case of uh, agriculture, it's agriculture yields and productivity. Um, and unless we, unless, we can un unless we can measure it, we cannot manage it, right? So how do you make sense of like with lack of data um, uh, in, in this world? And, and that's where also AI helps, where using AI, you can actually generate synthetic data to augment the observational data that you have to produce like, again, to, to make sense of like the patterns that you are seeing. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause here. Uh, great, Manchu. I mean, that really puts perspective on, on, the, on the code blue and the need for really merging technologies in a sector like agriculture. Um, Anshuman, I want to bring you in here. I mean, you've been a serial entrepreneur. You've done uh, different types of startups. Uh, and, you know, when people do climate tech startups, much like Manchu, people do something in agriculture or satellite imagery or, or electric cars. Why education of climate change? And what are you seeing in terms of the kind of cohorts you're getting? And how you know can we look forward to change makers coming out of your cohorts? Thanks, Paula. <clears throat> so uh, uh, I think first off, uh, it's a great privilege to be with this audience and to uh, everyone who's also listening in right now with all the great questions. Uh, when I was uh, trying to transition into climate about two years back, the big aha moment for me was that uh, this big disconnect, which was, uh, it seemed like on one side, we were talking about fundamentally transforming energy, agriculture, transportation, manufacturing, construction, and not just in one country, but in countries as diverse as US, China, and India, and not in 100 years, but in the space of 10 to 20 years. And yet, to me, the big disconnect was that the number of people seeming to be working in climate directly seemed to be a million or two million, depending on how you count. And that didn't make any sense because it, to me, it felt like if we were to transform a third to a half of the world's GDP, which is what this planetary level crisis requires us to, we would need 100 million people working in climate, not one or two million. And that needs to happen over the next 10 years. So what Terra is, is basically a ramp for these 99 million people who are outside climate right now to get into climate to use their professional skills. The way we do that is by running an online school and community which runs a bunch of different programs of all kinds that I'll tell you in just a bit. But the idea is to find everything from investment bankers bringing their uh, finance and their capital allocation skills to farmers who can bring in regenerative farming to software engineers who could work at amazing companies like climate.ai uh, to uh, teachers who can now teach climate science differently compared to what we have been uh, taught all these many years, and lawyers and accountants and so on and on and on. 
So for us, uh, the mission is to figure out a way to take each of these different professions and upskill them with the right amount of cl climate knowledge to find their place in climate solutions, either as jobs or as companies that they might start. So uh, uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of people that we have, when we started out, we attracted people who are, you could argue, at the top of Maslow's hierarchy. Right? They've self-actualized themselves. They now want to spend their time in trying to solve this world problem. Uh, as you've grown, uh, the climate crisis has become a lot more mainstream and climate solutions for that have also become a lot more mainstream. And that is evident from the fact that, as Mr. Uh, Godridge mentioned, that my favorite example of uh, capitalism in red tooth and claw, Larry Fink, the head of Blackstone, uh, of BlackRock, sorry, uh, talking about uh, how climate risk was the primary lens through which they would be looking at investment and divestment of assets. That shook the world of capital, right? And that's what's happening right now. So we, we our, our audience for Terra has also changed quite a bit. We went from Maslow's hierarchy to now we have a program for workers in the oil and gas sector, especially the geologists and the reservoir engineers who know that all new exploration is going to stop and they need to find new jobs. So there's fear. Um, then there is greed. So we have a bunch of venture capitalists, and I, I mean greed in the best possible way. We have a bunch of venture capitalists, family offices who are now looking to reallocate capital into climate, and they're coming in in droves through our programs. And we have a program for high schoolers, which is another audience altogether, which I think is the original impetus and the original uh, um, energy source for all that has happened in the climate movement in the past four or five years. And we want to figure out a way to support that as well and have them become the future climate leaders in each of these different professions. Thanks, uh, uh, Anshuman. It's heartening to know you have such an interesting cohort and we look forward to some more innovation coming out of them. Um, Radhika, do you have a couple of quick questions for them? Sure. Or I... Um, I have a couple, yeah. And I'm going to weave in some uh, questions that are okay. coming into Q&A as well. Uh, for the earlier speakers here. Um, so Anshuman, really inspiring to hear um, how you're kind of uh, helping the community and the ecosystem shift. Uh, one question is about, tell me a bit more about how do you see people getting activated, different types of people getting activated in the ecosystem as a result of your work? And also I'm going to pull in Madhu, a bit from Madhu Deshmukh's question in the chat. That's for the earlier speakers, but we great to hear your perspective. Your any thoughts on how to best address the adaptation gap? We've talked a lot about mitigation and sequestration efforts, and I see that you're touching on adaptation. Of what are the challenges? That tell us a bit broadly about what are what is the situation like in adaptation of change. Yeah, I'll just uh, maybe take a couple of examples. I think uh, one is we run a climate farm school which is right now just the US, but it's gonna to come to India in its next iteration a couple of months from now, where we sign up with these farms which are practicing regenerative farming mm -hmm. um, at scale. And uh, it's a residential plus online program, which is a very unusual thing for us, but it's very transformative for anyone who comes in and sees how food systems work. And food systems are a very important part of, uh, of climate problems and climate solutions as Himanshu is testament to. So that's one example of how adaptation is something that is being uh, roped into our own thinking. However, the other, I mean, I, our kind of, uh, I'll tell you my personal journey where when I was coming into climate, it seemed like there were so many exciting solutions to be potentially working on. Everything from carbon sequestration to uh, the kind of work that Ifanchu is doing and so on. And I just didn't, uh, I felt that my place personally was to build something which was a lot more horizontal if we could enable 100 million people, talented people across the world to just get the right amount of climate knowledge, then they would vote with their feet on what kind of mitigation and adaptation challenges were most relevant to their local context and their skills. And that's why the way we have built the platform is that, for example, we, run, we, uh, we ran an agriculture resilience program uh, with a, a team sitting out of uh, LATAM, which is focused on LATAM and Caribbean and how those supply chains could actually transform themselves. So we're building a platform where each of these individuals could come in from all parts of the world and build their own programs and build their own communities, which are focused on all these different aspects of uh, climate, including resilience. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, Himanshu, I have a question for you. Um, you incubated your company at Stanford while researching alongside one of your professors. 
What do you think is the role that academia and the scientific community can play across the life cycle of a new company like yours, particularly in the climate space, in, in advancing the SDG space? At Stanford, we have a long history of professors and uh, students starting companies, but this is a new area. So tell us a bit about that. We, we can't hear you. You're yeah, mute. On a, yeah, sorry about that. On a lighter note, I would say that all the first time founders um, uh, you know, all the companies, successful companies like Facebook, um, yeah, Snapchat, Instagram, Cisco, uh, started by first time founders got started out of like Stanford Docs. So there are two key things there. One is the first time founder. Um, and the other thing is the tech company. Um, and so I can talk about my experience at Stanford. Um, so there are one, um, as a first time founder, you, you basically rely on your credibility and your relationships and passion to convince uh, you know, an investor or even a customer to, make, take, to take a bet on you. Uh, I remember our first customer was a $700 billion pension fund. Uh, imagine uh, with two of us, which all we had like a PPT uh, with us. So we were able to convince the CEO of that pension to sort of take a bet on us and, and give us a project, uh, right? And I don't think it would have been possible if we were not students at Stanford back then. So it adds a lot of credibility uh, to you um, as first time founder. Two is if you're running deep tech companies uh, like we are, uh, uh, is for, a, for example, in our case, um, ours is like as deep uh, a tech in science as it gets, uh, both in climate science as well as in AI. Uh, a lot of this, initial development risk in research um, uh, and MVP is taken care of, right? So you can uh, collaborate quite a bit with professors um, uh, in, in the ecosystem. You can get access to some of the best talent in computer science um, and, and climate science from the university to kickstart uh, and catalyze the process uh, of more going from like an idea to an MVP while you are still a student there. Um, and that's the second thing. And third thing, which is like, not much talked about, um, and I think it's more relevant for immigrant founders like me. Is when when we were starting uh, was also the time when and when uh, President Trump became the president of of the U.S. And we were also scared, like as immigrants, like you know, what if you know with the visa that we'll get, do we will could we have to uh, move back and whatnot? And uh, you know, the university provided a safe space where you can still like test out your ideas and if, if, if the company works, you know, uh, of course you'll incubate the company and, and grow the company. If the idea doesn't work, great, you, 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 look, you look for a job. So that safe space uh, is something that university provided, especially back then, which is not much talked about. May, may I, Paula, just, uh, we, since we have the, someone who was involved in the founding a couple of decades ago in one of the biggest tech giants and microsystems, uh, maybe back to back, we get Professor Pratt's uh, perspective for a couple of minutes, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, tell us a bit about the founding days of Sun Microsystems uh, from, the, uh, from the professor's perspective, Professor Pratt. Well, uh, uh, from the professor's perspective, well, uh, I guess the uh, real driving force there, while well, it was the Stanford project, uh, was uh, Andy Bechtelsheim, who started out as a Forest Basket student. And I arrived at Stanford on sabbatical from MIT uh, in 1980. And uh, my, the person I was meant to collaborate with uh, had decided he would prefer to do business than to do the sort of work I'd been, the theoretical work I'd been doing. And so I found myself looking around for a project and was very excited by Forest Basket's uh, little workstation project. Uh, Andy was the uh, uh, real driver uh, in that project. And shortly afterwards, uh, Forrest left. And at the same time, Stanford offered me a job uh, to, as a professor, a full professor. That was a step up from being an associate professor at MIT. And... Um, uh, uh, so I ended up supervising Andy. Uh, Andy wanted to make it into a company which he called uh, VLSI Systems Incorporated, uh, dedicated to licensing the design of the Sun Workstation. Uh, but around about uh, that time, uh, actually it was January of 1982, Pino Kozler showed up wanting to, uh, wanting to uh, uh, find something to do after he'd left AZ Systems uh, and suggested that perhaps this uh, idea of licensing the design to a whole lot of companies uh, wasn't as good an idea as simply uh, making it into a company in its own right. 
Um, so uh, at that point, uh, Andy, who has already had this uh, BSI uh, company uh, in full swing, didn't uh, think that was a good idea. And so he resisted that strongly for about a month. Uh, but finally, uh, Vina managed to persuade him. And, uh, and that was basically uh, how Sun Microsystems got started. So Vina and Scott McNeely had both been doing an MBA at, uh, at uh, Stanford uh, in the business school. And uh, so Vina um, suggested to uh, Scott, they'd gone through together, uh, suggested to Scott that maybe uh, the two of them would be the business people and uh, Andy uh, would be the uh, uh, hardware person and I would be uh, software. Although at the time I was just trying to get uh, transferred from MIT to Stanford. So it was a bit awkward for me. But, uh, ended up being a consultant for the first year. Uh, and uh, um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but at least it gives you a bit of a picture of the history. Uh, and if it didn't answer the question, I'd be happy to answer to a more focused one. Oh no, history is always a lot more fun, Howitt. And for me, my first job was at Sun Microsystems, as was, I must say, for those of you youngsters. It was a Google of our day. It was like a fat pipe going from the Stanford Computer Science Department. Everyone, their first job from the CS department was almost at Sun. So you all catalyze something amazing, Professor Pratt. Uh, I, um, can we take some questions from the audience as well, Paula, for the entrepreneurs yes. and everyone? Yes. You can... Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question, I think, uh, maybe for Himanshu and for Professor Pratt on, you know, bes uh, how, what role can AI play, uh, you know, besides uh, uh, climate assessment uh, and predictions on actually, uh, you know, uh, implementing on the ground? Um, uh, solving climate change effects on the ground. Is there a role that AIML can play in uh, actually solving things on the ground? Uh, maybe a couple of you may want to take it, maybe Manchu and uh, Professor Pratt to start with. And then there are a couple of questions, I think, for Dipali and what Mr. Gondrej as well. Sure. Um, so um, as far as AI is concerned, uh, we use AI in three ways. Like one is, how do we use AI to predict um, uh, climate better. Uh, second is, how do you translate, let's say, when you predict the risk of heat waves and droughts um, uh, and floods and wildfires and what have you, how do you translate its impact on the business metrics or supply chain metrics that the companies care about? Uh, so in, in food and ag, would, would, it would be like, what is going to be the impact of this heat wave and droughts on, on the incidences of salmonella outbreaks? If you are like uh, the head of supply chain for Walmart, worried about the salmonella outbreak uh, happening somewhere globally. Uh, and, and the third, uh, third part, so uh, prediction impact, and the third part is the, is, is the delivery of these insights and making it actionable uh, for, the, for our customers as well as customers of our customers. Um, just to give you a concrete example, the very fact that we are in adaptation business, what that means is your AI can actually incentivize or nudge your users to take actions which they otherwise won't take when it comes to adapting to climate change, right? So in our case, we don't directly sell to farmers. We work with, uh, with food companies and, and agribusinesses who in turn work with farmers. So let's say if our AI tells that what to plant, when to plant and how to plant in a growing season uh, and its insight is delivered to a farmer on an SMS um, or uh, you know, on their uh, uh, iPads in, in, in developed economies, uh, then it sets up a rippling, you know, a ripple effect across the supply chain. So based on like if how the farmers are adapting, uh, if they are planting a drought resistant seed for the season, the seed companies get this information like, okay, we need to be uh, moving a lot of our inventory from, from US to Australia and, and minimize, of course, optimize our profits and minimize uh, seed waste that we see. So this is like one example of how uh, AI could be used at a ground level to create an impact. And in fact, uh, in, in, in our case, the impact is help, help the users adapt to climate change. Well, let me uh, point out that uh, Himanshu's uh, area is adaptation. And uh, my proposal was uh, basically uh, stopping uh, removing the fossil fuels from the ground. So these are complementary approaches uh, to the problem, uh, respectively, to uh, try to mitigate the impact, reduce the impact, and uh, to adapt to the impact. That's uh, what Amanshi was talking about. And as far as uh, reducing the uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, fossil fuel from the ground, um, it seems to me that this is 
largely a political problem that is solved by having people vote for the politicians that can have some say in controlling the people, the uh, outfits that are actually doing the, the mining of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so uh, to the extent that AI can play a role in politics, I actually don't know much about that. Uh, so um, uh, I would say uh, vote with your feet rather than with your machines. Uh, there are a couple of questions, I think, for the Pali uh, on uh, financing of energy efficiencies. And you talked about, uh, you know, distributed re renewable energy, but I think that, uh, people have alluded to the fact that should we not reward energy efficiencies, Mr. Godrich also referred to that. So maybe both of you want to uh, talk about that. And I want maybe Anjuman to take a stab at uh, how people are viewing these kind of problems uh, as entrepreneurs as well. And I also wanted to add that Dipali, when you address that question, if you could also touch on your response you added there about your Rockefeller Foundation's climate related metrics and how you decide on investments, because a lot of people seem to want to know that they may not read the comments. So for you two questions, Dipali. So I'll, I'll probably go back to the previous question first, Paula. So, you know, uh, we have also at Rockefeller Foundation, along with Stanford, launched Atlas AI, uh, you know, and that is, again, doing a lot of things that Himanshu, you've been talking about. So I think if you're not connected up, I mean, that's, again, a very good and interesting you know, a piece of work which is happening across Africa where we're really looking at, you know, how do you help the marginalized farmers to be able to, smallholder farmers to be better equipped to look at some of these issues by using AI. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I guess in terms of energy efficiency, absolutely. I mean, that is critical uh, with, especially when, you know, we started setting up mini grids along with the private sector in India. Uh, very quickly, we realized that, you know, the machines, whether it was the flour machines or the atta chakki as we refer to them or the rice hulling machines anything you know they unless you used energy efficient appliances it was not just going to be a sustainable business model so definitely you know energy efficiency is just very very critical and you know that's something that we obviously are kind of like looking at how do we really uh, look at the core elements of how that can be financed so that, you know, we're just not looking at it from an India perspective, but whatever is being done in India, how can that, then that be useful for um, Africa? Uh, so I think um, I, I just want to, I mean, I'm sorry I didn't touch on that, but that is absolutely critical. Uh, I guess going on then to your next question, Radhika, around the metrics, you know, I think, again, we are at a place where, you know, I mentioned that we are launching this Global Energy Alliance. So, you know, we're really trying to work with a cross section of our partners to really see how we can all come together to having a unified way of how we are going to look at the climate metrics and also looking at the globally accepted climate metrics, because I think that's the other challenge that some of us face that, you know, each one of us tries to develop our own metrics. And that really makes it difficult for folks on the other side, you know, as to if they're working with a range of venture philanthropies and they're trying to attract impact investors, et cetera. So I think that's, that's work that's happening. Uh, of course, you know, we have used metrics in the past, but going forward, you know, we're we are trying to really get at those that, you know, are more synced with the universally accepted metrics. Um, in terms of financing, uh, you know, again, we do do innovative finance and we do do program related investments from a foundation perspective. So whether it's debt, whether it's equity, we're doing a lot of blended finance facilities across Asia and Africa. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to Get in, I mean, folks that are interested, I'll be happy to make the connections within the foundation with the teams that are leading that work. But I think, you know, it's also been interesting in our own journey, the whole, you know, field of impact investing actually got seeded at a convening that we'd hosted way back in 2007 at Bellagio. I'm not sure if any of you have been to Bellagio, which is a beautiful center mm -hmm. that we can, so Radhika, you've been there. So that was I there, you know, we coined the whole term around innovative finance. So, you know, more and more with the work that we try to do we're really trying to see where blended finance has to be playing such an important role and how do we really use our resources as high risk capital to really make sure that the work that we're trying to do can get to a place whether through our grant funding or through blended finance to be able to really attract commercial capital so i hope that answers the questions that you had posed 
Yeah, and I must clarify that that last question was not from me. It was from Matt Chanoff, who is a thought leader on the board of the Effective uh, Center for Effective Global Action at UC Berkeley and might be good synergies in the spirit of uh, collaboration. I'd be happy to make that connection afterwards. And I must say for a second that uh, Bellagio is one of the most amazing places I've been to on the shores of beautiful Lake Como, an old monastery converted into a beautiful retreat by the Rockefeller Foundation for mission-driven people to go and ideate for free. So all of you social entrepreneurs, check it out. It's an amazing gift to society. Um, but uh, I think Nadir, the, um, uh, Paul has a question for, us, for you as well. And I want to add, uh, Nadir, if you could also address the question of carbon tax, you know, which Raghuram Rajan has proposed uh, with a sort of honor code kind of a carbon tax and how effective that would be, and alongside also the efficiency uh, financing question. Uh, uh, yes, um, and energy efficiency is should be easier to finance than green energy because payback periods are extremely short, risk is very low. Uh, the question is which institution will do it. For business, it's not a problem at all. Uh, for business, the challenge is more figuring out what investment to make. Financing it is not a problem at all. And the moment you put somebody on the job, they'll find a hundred solutions. The question is we don't spend enough management time trying to improve energy efficiency in business. For the consumer, it should be easy to finance. And I think Dipali answered the question. Uh, Paula, what was the next question? Uh, you know, oh, the carbon let me interject. Let me interject something about yes. the efficiency. Um, I think it's important to distinguish uh, uh, consuming consumers and producers. Uh, so uh, efficiency for consumption uh, is extremely important. If you can uh, make uh, every device in the world twice as efficient, all of a sudden uh, you'd only need half as much uh, fossil fuel. Um, but the converse side on production. Uh, the question somebody asked, uh, uh, since solar panels are only 35% efficient, even in the theoretical limit, uh, don't we have to worry about that efficiency? And the answer to that one is, well, solar panels are getting cheaper, and uh, it's more a matter of just producing more solar panels rather than uh, agonizing over the fact that, well, they're not 100% efficient, and uh, why is... Uh, uh, so we shouldn't really worry about 35% efficiency for solar panels. And the same goes for... Uh, any other renewable uh, source. If, as long as you can uh, keep uh, producing enough energy from the source, uh, you don't care about the efficiency of production. Uh, the, the efficiency concerns uh, should be confined to consumption. Yeah. Yeah. On the carbon tax, I'm not very sure uh, what Raghuram Rajan's proposal is. Is it like a carbon shadow price that some companies use? Yes, that can be useful. But the great advantage of a carbon tax is that it provides a level pay, uh, playing field and you are not at a disadvantage to your competitors. And it doesn't take a very high carbon tax to get a drastic change in the amount of our carbon uh, emissions. And as I pointed out in my speech, uh, a carb carbon tax, if it replaces some other tax, should have no negative economic effect. And it would be a very useful solution for solving climate change. And uh, I mentioned a $60 price because technology has advanced so much, you probably don't need a higher price than that to eliminate emissions. Um, there are a couple of other questions. Um, I think for um, maybe Anshuman and even uh, uh, you know the other panelists. Anshuman, there's a question as to whether climate science should be very much integrated part of uh, of school curriculum, and how how much is there any move in that direction? Which is a little bit different than environmental science. Yeah, I think. Uh... I mean, the answer is uh, an absolute yes, of course. The question is how, and uh, what's the objective of that, uh, that knowledge? And one of the things that uh, we see amongst adults is exactly what we see amongst uh, youngsters as well, even more so, which is the first question, the zero to level question is, um, I'm aware about climate change, I care, um, what can I do? Um, and uh, the, if you don't get an answer to that question very quickly, 
which is directly relevant to your local context, it leads to despondency, which is, well, this is such a big thing that I might as well turn my head away in some other direction and kind of carry on uh, as, as the planet falls, uh, falls to pieces around me. And that kind of doomerism is something that I worry about at all levels, uh, at adult levels, but even more so at the younger uh, children level. So therefore, the kind of, I don't think we need uh, just climate science. I think we need a focus on climate solutions, where the step one is to talk about the science. Uh, step two is to talk about the solutions. And step three is to figure out some action path, which is what kids are amazing at, right? Which is, can you take a local context? Can you take what you just learned and use that to build even a mini movement around the local uh, context that you live in? And I mean, I, I mean, honestly, to me, the biggest thing that gives me uh, faith in all that's happening in, um, amongst climate, climate solutions is, is what our kids are capable of. And I'm time and again reminded of that when we have 12-year-olds, 8-year-olds apply to our programs. And I, it, it cuts, cuts me up to not be able to teach hydrogen to them. Uh, but they're clear that they need to learn it now. And so to me, that level of enthusiasm and optimism about the world is something that climate uh, education in schools has to wrap in. It can't just be throwing facts at you. I would be interested in getting Professor Pratt's perspective on this. I know you're considering teaching a climate basics class, Professor Pratt, at college students, but also for, and I, I maybe it's just a thought, but also maybe college students and earlier, and that linkage that Anshuman touched on, like uh, the climate science integrated with why it's important and the action. I love that, Anshuman, the three-pronged uh, approach. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Professor Pratt, and how we could uh, go about it? To bring that change, uh, it's one thing to have that vision. How do we make this happen in the world quickly? Well, as you might have gathered, uh, my focus has been on understanding uh, the problem, understanding the actual uh, mechanisms behind uh, uh, global warming. Uh, so, uh, as far as uh, teaching a course or interacting with students, whether they're graduate students, undergraduates, uh, high school, or even uh, elementary school, um, Obviously, I'd be kind of in the role of, uh, say, a physics professor rather than a uh, social sciences uh, professor. Um, but uh, even so, uh, you know, I'd be happy to comment <laughs> outside my expertise uh, and, and, and collaborate. Uh, so, um, uh, Perhaps, Deepali, I'll throw it at you post Como. Uh, I mean, post-COVID, uh, maybe this could be a Bellagio retreat, how to rapidly bring this unusual partners on climate education, a three-pronged climate education. It's, uh, it's needed and the change makers of the young change makers are the ones who are bringing the change. And absolutely, how do we engage with them rather than, you know, decide what needs to be done by them? So, you know, if they can be truly participating in looking at what, you know, providing them the knowledge so that they can make informed decisions. But I think really keeping their well-being at the center, because I think most of us assume, you know, what uh, they can do or what they want. So I think if you can have them be part of that um, unusual actor category, then all for it. And why shouldn't oh, they learn from someone like Professor Pratt's presentation, even if they're in high school? In this virtual world, anything is possible, right? To break the silos yes. of high school and college. Yeah. So, so I think uh, one shouldn't look at uh, the, uh, uh, the upcoming uh, youth as uh, homogeneous. Uh, there's a tremendous variety there. And uh, one really needs to sort of uh, sort people into what they're best at and uh, uh, focus on different categories of people with different interests. Uh, you can't just say, well, we're going to teach a class on this subject. Uh, you really, uh, this is a big subject and you really need to teach diversity of classes. Um, I think before we wrap up, I have just one last question. Uh, maybe Manchu, you can take a stab at it first. Um, you know, for especially for the young people who are out here and hopefully they'll become climate uh, founders like uh, much like you guys. What are the different levers a climate tech entrepreneur uh, needs to pull compared to, let's say, other companies that you may have built, which are apps and, uh, you know, maybe SaaS products and so on. Does the climate um, entrepreneur need to have different skills to build the kind of products or solutions? Uh, because it's a very complex problem. <laughs> My I think point the exactly. problem might be <laughs> complicated, uh, but the skill sets still remain the same. Three skill sets. Can you build a stellar team? Uh, Greater, greater execution and strategy. Can you understand your customer really, really well? Now, a customer could be 
uh, you know, a big, uh, you know, agribusiness player like Cargill's and Godrej's of the world, or, or it could be a small farmer uh, in, in a small handful of farmer in Latin America or India or Africa. So do you understand their problems really, really well, rather than like, you know, this is the solution that it's looking for a problem uh, right now. And third, which is the most important thing is passion. It's hard, right? And it's, it's, you know, even though there's so much of funding coming into venture capital right now, it's climate tech venture capital, but uh, the industry hasn't seen like true climate tech success stories yet. So until that scene, it's going to be hard. And the only way you can persist there as an entrepreneur is you have an insane amount of passion. And I'm talking about like Greta Thunberg's uh, kind of a passion. Uh, you'll, you know, when we started, when we launched Climate AI 2017 and we were giving pitches to VCs, we, they, they told us, hey, hey guys, are, are you guys running a non-profit or what? Of course, uh, four years and then things have changed quite a bit. Uh, so I would say like passion is the only difference. Otherwise, uh, rest all remains the same. And I'm quickly like, and I'll stop here, going back to the earlier question on kids' education, uh, or an ed tech, Anshuman and, and, and uh, uh, Nadir and Professor Bell talked about is, it's already happening. Look at Greta Thunberg's of the world. She was 12 years old. And she has been, again, at the risk of not sounding politically correct here, she was more effective in driving action than the United Nations in the last five years on climate front. So kids are already well aware. Uh, it's about like uh, listening to them and engaging with them as, as I think Deepali mentioned. We need the Greta Thunberg Zoo. Thank you for honoring her. We also need the United Nations in my opinion. I will say that this is Anga moment. There, that passion is amazing and important, but uh, there is also need for, in my opinion, also structured large organizations, large foundations to come together. The problem is too big just for, just for uh, young entrepreneurs alone. And I have to say that because I do think we from Stanford Silicon Valley maybe overweigh the power of passion. And it, it is very important, but not enough institutions also have a role to play in my view and regulation and policy. So I will add in a slightly a complimentary perspective. And there. Businesses. And big, uh, big companies as well, like the Godrejus, I think uh, it will not be enough only to have the amazing growth get a uh, I admire and love, but uh, um, in, in a more systematic manner, the, the Godrej industries and uh, the United Nations are having huge impact as well. And since it's Anga anniversary, I must say as a UN child that in this moment than ever before the United Nations is extremely important, that bridge building is important, but also that spirit of leaving no one behind that the United Nations stands for is very important for a just climate transition. Um, great, uh, I think we are slightly over time, uh, but uh, you know, we're ready to wrap up. Uh, if anybody has any last comments or I would just like to thank everybody. Radhika, any last comments, uh, any of the speakers? Uh, Nadir, we didn't hear too much from you in this last 10, 15 minutes. I want, uh, if you have any thoughts on this education debate we had, like, or how can we bring more education? Um, I'd be very interested in, um, as we wrap up, just getting a final thoughts there. Did you ask me? Yes, Nadir, on this yeah. uh, topic we discussed on what is it going to take, what kind of education to create awareness in the youth on climate change? I, I thought that Anshuman's idea was good, that uh, the youth would like to do things. So uh, I, I think most people are aware of climate change now, except people who are studiously denying it. And uh, so we don't need a lot of education, but we certainly need opportunities for people to do something about climate change. And I would follow Anshuman's idea to get uh, uh, children to start doing things. Great. Well, now over to you to wrap us up. Great. I mean, it was an engaging discussion and I think we could go on and on. I think we have another couple dozen questions we could, uh, you know, debate. Uh, but thank you uh, to, you know, all the stellar panel, uh, Mr. Godrej, Professor Pratt, Dipali, and of course, Himanshu and Anshuman. A lot of energy, a lot of ideas and a lot of deep insights. So I think we are going back with a different perspective and we hope to carry this forward in different forums and, uh, you know, hopefully we can say more action uh, going forward. So thank you. And a big thanks to Radhika for really taking this initiative alongside Danga to, to bring us all together. And especially as Stanford Angels, I'm, I'm deeply uh, gratified that we have not only other chapters of Stanford Angels, but also some amazing co-conveners, Wings, SDG, Basis, 
and Rockefeller, uh, you know, uh, to bring us all together. Uh, once again, thank you for taking your time and thank you to an amazing audience uh, joined across time zones and geographies. And for the wonderful questions, the recording will be made available. We'll also put it on YouTube and we will uh, email you back uh, with the recording links. So thank you once again and let's hope for a better future. I just wanted to give a shout out Thanks. to that one person in the audience who renamed themselves Great Thunberg. Awesome. Do it. <laughs> a really yeah, good great audience and great participation from the audience. So big thank and you for joining. Thank, thank you. you. And there's many, many thank more you. Greta Thunbergs coming out um, uh, from um, the young